before we run out of time, I'd love to just hit a, another couple points um, of, you know, we, we see this, we see this like associated a lot with the kind of European fairy tales, right? The, um, this is the most iconic mushroom in the world, arguably, you know, you see it in Absolutely. illustrations Absolutely. of books. And I, I don't know, it's, it's interesting that with, with things like psilocybin and, and DMT, these other naturally occurring things, people do see kind of elf-like kind of, you know, entities and things. You mentioned that people have this experience of kind of contacting the ancestors with, with Amanita. I, I, I've not actually read much about this, but I, it just, it, I guess it's, it's pointed to so often. I feel like there's some connection there of the kind of the mushroom folk, elves and fairies and, and these psycho, psychoactive mushrooms. I'm not so sure uh, because there's so many other mushrooms that um, also are connected with elves and fairies. In fact, in the 19th century uh, in England, um, almost all mushrooms, I mean, you know, a lot of paintings uh, of fairy folk or brownies, uh, and they were, uh, the mushrooms were not amity to fairy at all. Some of them were what's called uh, fairy ring mushrooms, or some of them were just generic. And absolutely my favorite painting, and I think it might be in this book. Uh, this is a version of it. This is from the 1840s or 1850s. And it's going to be higher. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, higher. Here we go. There you go. This is from my book, oh. Fungipedia. It's, a ver uh, it's an illustrator's um, line drawing version of a painting by, you ever heard of Richard Dadd, D-A-D-D? -D -D? He no. was a Victorian artist who spent most of his time in a lunatic asylum. Uh, he killed his father, and he was uh, determined to be insane, and spent 50 years of his life there, where he did all sorts of incredible paintings. This one, uh, the painting that I, I think it, it, your um, people who are your viewers should look up Richard Dad plus Puck, because he's got an image of Puck, the primordial fairy figure, seated on top of a giant whitish yellow, not Amanita muscaria, but generic whitish yellow mushroom, and smiling, um, shall we say, salaciously, while dancing around the mushroom are nude men and women. <laughs> now, I wish I could hold up the, the actual of painting for you, but uh, I don't have it on the premises. But that indicates uh, really that the fairy connection goes well beyond Amanita muscaria uh, to uh, a notion. And it has a lot to do with a number of different attitudes, one of which is the traditional mycophobic attitude of mm. Brits, that is mycophobia being hatred, dislike, or disgust toward mushrooms. Um, Brits are not, of course, alone in that attitude. Right. But uh, yeah, it's it's very interesting um, that that uh, when we think of eating this, that in North America there is only one native group that I or anyone else has documented as eating Anamnesia muscaria. At all on the coast of California, Washington, Oregon, it commonly grew, grows, but none of the native people ever ate it. Uh, this one group is in an area in uh, the Yukon, and it's a small group of about 1,500 people, and they had their, it's possible that they had some contact with Siberia because their, their shamans would drink it urinate, people would drink the urine, but it was basically, uh, it was also not just the shamans, it was a young girl. Uh, she would eat it and urinate, and then someone would drink the urine and have a vision, and what they do were they were doing, using it in hunting caribou, and by drinking the young girl's urine, they would have an image of where the caribou were. That's, they were using it not to get in touch with their ancestors, assuming that caribou weren't their ancestors, but to find out where in the mountains and the valleys we can find the caribou. 
And I asked one of the elders who told me about this, well, did you ever drink a young girl's urine? And he grimaced, he said, yes, a few times. The grimace indicated that it was perhaps better if one had to pick and choose both not to drink the urine and not to find a caribou. <laughs> Um, so you, you've mentioned, I think, in a lecture I saw, um, the importance of laughter in certain ones of these cultures. Maybe it was in the Chukchi. Um, and is that, is that something that you feel is linked to the kind of the effects of the mushroom, of the, of the Amanita, the fact it produces this kind of mildly euphoric or positive feeling? I think that's one of the effects of it. Um, uh, but I, I also think that... Um, I travel a lot with these northern native cultures. I'll give you an example of something that happened. I was having coffee in a tent in Greenland, and it was very windy, and I was having coffee with a uh, local Greenlander. And finally, the wind blew the tent down on top of us and spilled the coffee, etc. And I cursed mightily, and he burst into riotous laughter. Because one of the ways that you manage uh, the difficulties of life in northern cultures in which there are traditionally more difficulties than there are in climate control, temperate cultures, is laughter. And I'm actually writing about this now because one of the ways I think one can manage the difficulties of COVID-19 is laughter or humor as well. Um, I've often seen this. Uh, I was at a place in the 90s where the fax machine malfunctioned and a white guy came and tried to use it, and then kicked it, walked away. And an Inuk came, tried to use it, malfunctioned, burst into laughter and walked away. Uh, excellent survival mechanism. <laughs>